what should I expect? That it picks what as a Yeah, so what would you expect if you apply this vector quantization approach on this manifold? First of all, do you have expect that it finds more than, one, one, more than two clusters? Yes or no? It shouldn't. Huh? If it was a good <laughs> clustering method, it wouldn't find more than two. And uh, should it find uh, uh, more than one important variable? I think the answer is no, right? It should only find one important variable. And so let's see if this is true. So when we apply this to this manifold, no matter, so let's say you initialize with 100 cluster, in the end, your, approach, your VQ part uh, partitioning approach will give you only two clusters. It will say cluster 99 is empty, remove it. Cluster 81 is empty, remove it. Huh? And then you will end up with just two of them. And uh, uh, regardless of the number that you put in the initialization, okay? And the other thing which is interesting is that if you start putting noise in the data, and this actually found it remarkable, it actually clusters the noise. It doesn't cluster as splitting, you know, in this region. It starts clustering the noise so that uh, when you look at the correlation between the first principal component and uh, the mixer fraction, you get an R square which goes to one. Uh, so it means that the first principal component explains 99% of the variance, and it's the mixer fraction. Yeah? Could you explain how you go to the distances in the previous case? Maybe I missed it this part. Yeah. Let's go back. I compute the projection. So the error, the difference between the original data and its low dimensional projection. Okay. okay? Okay, so what would happen if you apply a supervised condition? So if I just do FPCA and I say I want four clusters, then I, okay, I have to split here, 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 and here. And of course, as mo the more you split, the more you lose correlation with the mixer fraction. Huh? And this, I think it's a sign that this is not a very good uh, partitioning or supervised uh, partitioning approach. I mean, unless you know, unless you know that you have to choose at most two clusters. And because, of course, if you choose two clusters, you have a 100% R square. Huh? But, of course, if you start adding clusters, then you get, uh, you, I mean, you lose correlation between the mixer fraction and your principal component. Yes? So we create one, uh, a million realization using the equations. We know the equations. Okay. Huh? So you have temperature, temperature, CO2, temperature, CO2 H2O, and 2 O2, CH4. And you don't have Z, the mixture fraction? No, we don't. We don't. It finds it. Huh? Ah. So that's okay. cool that it finds it. No, no, I didn't get it. So <laughs> this makes a very big difference. Yeah, yeah. Okay, what about uh, the, uh, the um, equilibrium manifold? Uh, we get the similar results. So you see uh, uh, the same uh, with, with uh, more or less noise, uh, uh, just to see uh, what happens on the data. And you see that you have the same uh, conclusion that it identifies that the only variable which is important in the manifold is the mixer fraction. So it correctly finds what we knew, uh, of course, before. But this is actually good because we know that when we apply to another system that we don't know, we will find a good feature. Okay, so uh, I want to also point out one point uh, uh, briefly. Uh, so I mentioned before that I see uh, this locally linear reconstruction to be superior to autoencoders for the simple reason that you have uh, uh, less uh, hyperparameters to train and you can get interpretation of the features. Because, of course, once you have a, a cluster, you can go into cluster, you have the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, so you know what the features are. And so we wanted to see, on the other end, if the autoencoder and the local PCA were finding similar structures. Uh, but this is difficult because you have understood that uh, 
our local PCA, you have clusters, and so you have a, a local coordinate system in each cluster. And so to do so, uh, we uh, used uh, an approach which is called Procrustes analysis. Anyone knows about it? Okay, so this is a, a comparison of shapes uh, under translation, scaling, and rotation. So it means that you might have two, fe two features which are very, very similar, but they are translator, rotated, and scaled. And so if you apply translation, rotation, or reflection, and scaling, you end up understanding that they are not so different after all. Okay? So this is the principle of Procrustes analysis. And so when we do that, it's kind of interesting that we find out that, in fact, the local PCA reconstruction tends to be an autoencoder reconstruction as the number of cluster tends to infinity. Uh, infinity 128 here. <laughs> okay? So this is actually interesting because it means that we kind of find the same nonlinear code that autoencoder finds, but with a locally linear approach. Okay, so uh, to conclude this part, uh, we have a broad range of methods for size reduction and feature extraction. Nonlinear methods, of course, outperform PCA uh, in terms of uh, accuracy for a given number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, dimensions. But I, I think, I personally think they're very difficult to interpret and they cannot be directly translated into predictive models. What I like of local PCA and lo locally linear models that were presented before is that they combine size compression and the interpretability. Uh, of course, they also have problems of being translated directly into models because you, you, then you have uh, 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 different regions that have to talk to each other. And as Bern was mentioning, maybe the challenge of the future will be to know how these talk with each other, huh? to develop really predictive models based on those. Um, but still, they can be used. Uh, I think you see that the, they can be still used very efficiently for classification approaches. Huh? Uh, which is one of the machine learning, uh, one of the two uh, things that machine learning have to do. Um, and I also think that uh, uh, in machine learning, there, are, uh, s there is still need to further develop and automize the approaches for the analysis of massive data set, which is not yet the case. Okay, now, now that, it, uh, th is there any question up to now? Because I will uh, change subject in a moment. Okay. Um, now, you have seen that we have found, uh, we, we can find, yes, sorry. Uh, you have a so, the, so the, the beauty of your approach, having first the clustering and then the PCA, is that you can also tune the dimension. So you may know that in certain dimensions, the dynamics is simple, you need two dimensions here, yeah. maybe t 10 dimensions there. This is something where you could never do with uh, a locally uh, linear embedding. But the, the, the unnice thing is you have the same problem as in discontinuous Gaiokin methods. I mean, if you consider your thing as an autoencoder, then on the boundary, yeah. So this, let's say the Voronoi cells, uh, uh, um, you, you have discontinuities. You're right. And, and, and the discontinuities would be, a re, uh, 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 you don't have discontinuities in locally linear embedding. Uh, but of course, you, you can have other interpolations which remove the discontinuities, but this re require an additional step. So there's an advantage of your approach, and, 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 but also uh, um, a, a challenge if you consider this as an autoencoder. You're right. And in fact, we, uh, we have looked into that into one dimensions in ways we can actually enforce continuity at the boundaries. Uh, but uh, as you move uh, to more dimensions, it becomes more complicated, of course. But this, this is exactly the trade-off uh, that you mentioned is, is exactly what we have uh, also observed. Huh? Um, now, uh, we have identified these principal components. And now we can, uh, we can uh, claim, and we can actually wonder whether we can use these principal components to formulate models, okay? Now, uh, as I, me I mentioned in the beginning that in these uh, combustion systems, you have uh, hundreds of species, but of course you might imagine that there is some degree of correlation between them, right? I mean, at least you would hope, because otherwise <laughs> it's a big problem. Huh? And so, Indeed, we know that uh, these reacting scalars are, are, are correlated in state space. And so what we want to explore is whether we can use PCA to find 
uh, the best progress variable or reaction variables that describe the system in a low dimensional manifold. Okay, so this brought us to formulate uh, a model that we call PC transport. Uh, PC transport approach back in uh, 2009 with, uh, with my colleague uh, James Sutherland. At the moment, I didn't know I was doing machine learning, uh, but uh, now <laughs> they told me afterwards that I was doing that. Uh, so the idea is that you start with a transport equation for the scalars. The difference with a, a passive scalar is that you have a, a source term, and here this will make a big difference, uh, you will see. And then you do this projection onto the principal components, and you get a fewer number of transport equations for your principal components huh? that are a mapping from your original state to the reduced state. Okay, now you have fewer equations, but you have a few problems as well. First of all, you have this transport term. I will not talk about that today, but you have to do something to express the transport terms in the, pr in the, in the principal component space. So there are ways to do that. You have to do some uh, assumptions as well. But the biggest problem is the uh, source term. And why this is the, a big problem? Because of course we know that the source term depends linearly on the source terms of each of the species in the original data. So in principle, you might be able to reconstruct this source term using recomputing all the state space, then using a Arrhenius equation, to compute the source term of each species and then computing the source term of the principal component. The problem is that the mapping between a state space and the source term is nonlinear. Okay? And so as you do a small error here, this is magnified in the nonlinear mapping of the Arrhenius equation. And so this is a real problem. Huh? It's a real problem because it reduces the number of components that you can Retain. So it means that you have to use more components to make up for this nonlinear error propagation. So there is a way out, of course, and it would be to use a machine learning approach huh? or a regression approach, which is the second task of machine learning is regression, as we learned in the morning, to directly relate the principal components to their source term. And so there are different approaches that have been used by different groups. So uh, Stephen Pope, uh, Jackie Chen have been, used, uh, have been using uh, uh, multi-adaptive regression splines for doing that. Uh, other people in North Carolina have been using artificial neural networks. Of course, we had to do something different, and so we used <laughs> Gaussian process regression. We like, uh, now uh, uh, joking apart, we like a Gaussian process that is a, a semi-parametric regression approach and also as a measure of uncertainty associated to it. Okay, so um, we have used that and we have uh, uh, applied it to different uh, problems of different complexity. So we have started from very, very simple uh, reactor. So a zero-D reactor is a well-mixed reactor where only chemistry uh, is uh, involved. And then you see here on the left the evolution of uh, a few radicals, o, OH. Huh? And you see that, in fact, if you don't use this regression for the source term, out of the 12 original variables, you need uh, quite a few variables. Uh, you need seven uh, to get good approximation of these scalars because of the nonlinearity of the manifold. And so it means that you uh, are paying uh, for this nonlinear error propagation. Um, but when you go to this uh, uh, regression, you see that you can go from 12 to 2 without loss of accuracy. Then we expanded this to very complex mechanisms, still in 0D reactors. So the original mechanism here was 162 species, and you can do everything with uh, two components, uh, although you have to formulate your regression locally. Uh, otherwise, you have to add more components. And then this is, of course, interesting, but it's still uh, a toy problem because uh, you are not interested in running 0D reactors. You are interested in running real simulations. Okay. And so uh, what we then came up with is this uh, framework uh, when we have to simulate some very complex uh, multidimensional frame, uh, and then we have to generate a model based on the transport of principal components. And so to have uh, 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 data uh, to generate our models on, we use very simple reactors. So this is a, a month of CPU time. This is seconds of CPU time. And of course, this makes sense at this point because the part of generating data is very cheap compared to the function evaluation. But then, of course, there is a problem. Uh, no, not a problem. There is a, 
uh, you have to be careful that the data that you use uh, to generate the to, to generate this uh, this re reduced model must be representative of what you will explore or visit in the state space of the real simulation. Okay, so uh, I give you an example to see how this works. Uh, so these are important cheap valuations. These are very expensive function evaluations. So uh, I want to show you two examples. Uh, the first one is, uh, um, the first question that you have when you see this approach is, uh, can I use simple reactors to model complex or more complex configurations? To, to answer this question, we first performed uh, um, this study that was published in uh, 2016. So what we did was basically to take a laminar flame, reduce our model on a laminar flame, and we applied it on eight and seven turbulent flames. Okay. So now, of course, this is a, a quite challenging problem because I, we didn't even use multiple laminar flames. We just used one laminar flame, uh, and uh, we wanted to explore the possibility of uh, reconstructing flames in turbulent conditions. So this is, by the way, called a Borghi diagram. Uh, this is a, a diagram that describes the regime in which a turbulent premixed turbulent combustion takes place. Uh, so what is interesting is that we were able to do so, and you see uh, here some snapshots of the simulation. So for point one, two, three, four. Point one is of course very close to the laminar one. So you see that uh, the flame front is unperturbed. And then as you move in this direction, you have uh, flames which is uh, that are more broken, uh, and here you have flames which are more elongated. Okay. So what is interesting here, uh, uh, and, and this is one, one of the movies for, for this condition, I think, yeah. Uh, so you see the formation of these big, big, uh, big uh, structures. Um, what is interesting here uh, was that we, to compare uh, the results, uh, we were looking at conditional PDFs of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, a scalar. In this case, we took one chemical species, which is representative of the reaction process. And we could see, uh, you should look at the results of the score PCA approach, uh, that there was this conditional PDF was matching very, very well the uh, DNS uh, PDF. So showing that in fact, we were able with this reduced order modeling approach to capture exactly the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the state space observation with the, the DNS. And then uh, something else I would like to point out is, uh, 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 an LDS simulation uh, that we recently performed. Um, this is also a very famous, so for the people working in combustion, this, is a, this comes with no surprise. This is a, a flame which is usually used for benchmark. Uh, it's called Flame D. It's a piloted flame. So you see here the flame which is established. All these small flames here are piloted flames for igniting the flame. Okay. And then you have air on the sides. Uh, why this is often used? Because flame D is very easy. Huh? So <laughs> everyone wants to show that its model can work or her model can work on flame D because usually it works. The real complexity is to get flame F. Huh? Because flame F is a flame which is almost extinguished. And so a flame, a flame which is close to full extinction is very complex to capture. So what we did was to train uh, uh, data. And this is something that should be important to to retain, uh, we used uh, uh, transient uh, laminar counter diffusion flames. Uh, and we uh, performed a steady simulation by uh, perturbing with the sinusoidal input, uh, the, the flow velocity. And we collected a number of observations for generating this model. And then we used this model to perform 3D simulations with open foam. Uh, what is important to note here, uh, beside the other settings, is that we transport only two variables, huh? so the two principal components. Of course, we transport momentum, huh? but in the state space, we transport two variables and we get all the other ones from the PCA approach. Okay, so something I wanted to point out again is that uh, when we look at the principal components, uh, again, we find uh, this idea that they keep, uh, they pick the features uh, of the flame. And so you see that, for instance, a mixer fraction uh, F is very correlated to the first principal component, while the second principal component is somehow related to the progress of the reaction, which is indicated by the CO2 in, uh, in the fluid. Okay, so uh, this is what we solved for. 
and this is what we get, just uh, part of it. Of course, we get uh, all, all the state space, all the 50 uh, chemical species in the mechanism. And of course, we can compare. Everything works very well for flame D, which is a, a sanity check, if you want. But this is also working quite well for flame F. As I told you, this is a very complex flame that uh, um, to, to, to model. Okay. Uh, I think more interesting than this is this picture. I think this picture tells a lot about why this model works and how you, uh, what you have to do to make it work. Yeah. Dimension of your sorry. Uh, can you remind us of your dimension of your reduced order model? So it's a two. We transport two. So only only two features. So two dimensional. Two transport equations. Yeah. Well. Um, so the this is actually interesting because it shows very well why and what you have to do to make it work. Huh? So when we train our manifold, I said we were performing transient simulation uh, with unsteady counter diffusion flames. By doing so, we were able to cover the full state space uh, of, that could be visited in, in, during the, the numerical simulations. And then when you see the real simulation, the actual simulation that we perform, you see that, of course, when you run on flame D, I, sell, I told you this is a flame which is easier to model. You see that you have most of the branches which are on this ignited side, and you see that for flame F, uh, you really visit most of the initial space. But if your initial space was not containing this part, your model would have failed. Huh? It's clear. So you have to be sure that your model, that your training manifold contains uh, the data. And this is related to the comment of Bernd. It's very easy to interpolate. It's, oh, it's, it's not easy, but it's easier to interpolate than extrapolate. Okay. Uh, so what is nice of this approach, and we like it a lot, is that we get for a system the most important progress variable without expert judgment. Huh? We don't need an expert saying, oh, take the mixer fraction, take this progress variable. PCA does this for us. And uh, we also couple this approach with uh, nonlinear regression. And of course, uh, using nonlinear regression uh, removes some uh, generality of the approach, but allows to get very good, good size reduction in a way. Um, OK. OK, so and, and also uh, uh, we see that this approach is also very good in predicting uh, complex, complex systems. So is there any question on this part? Yeah. The diffuse yes, yes, I repeat. The so diffusivity in the transport equation of the two components. Yeah, so um, when we did this simulation, we took uh, Lewis number equal to one, but in principle, you can treat that. Uh, so if you assume Fikian diffusion, you can project the uh, transport term on the eigenvectors, okay, and you get a transport term in the, in the in the principal component space. The difficulty, of course, is that you have to also generate your uh, training data with non-Lewis non-unity Lewis number definition. But I mean, this is possible. What I mean, okay. But if you want, I can show you the details after. But in this case, we just consider turbulent diffusion. Uh, that's uh, for the simulation that I showed you. Okay, so I want to go back a little bit to the, uh, to the classification problem that we had before, and I want to show how this could be useful in a predictive simulation. So I told you that local PCA can give you, the, 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 can give you a, a, an autoencoder an representation of the system, and this is one thing, but it can also give you the, uh, let's say, the, the, what are the most important regions in the frame, and what the more, what, how they are, let's say, locally homogeneous, right, in a way. And so why this is very interesting, I think it's because by doing so, you can say, okay, if I have an optimal subdivision of my domain, and now you can also think if this can apply to your problem, you have a flow and you want to clusterize it somehow, uh, you can say, oh, this is interesting because I see that uh, uh, I have a cluster which is probably related to the flame region where I will need all the species in my mechanism, okay? But maybe in this region here, which is just uh, on the oxidizer side, 
I don't need all of them. I just need oxygen and nitrogen. Huh? And so I can reduce significantly the size of my problem. Okay, so this is uh, interesting and explains an approach that we have developed with the uh, um, with the Politecnico di Milano, and it's called SPARC, Simple Partitioning Adaptive Reduced Chemistry. So the idea is the following, uh, in this, all this machine learning approach, you need data, right? So we need data to train our approaches. So we have some data, and I showed you that you can uh, reasonably use 